Today on the A Push Show, we are looking at Chapter 32, The Age of Globalism. And as you can see, Taft is going global because he is larger than life and up front in front of the camera. We'll look at the resurgence of partisanship. Sheesh, I wonder if there'll be a resurgence of participlesanship, as Taft is blocking the entire shot without a care in the world. Apparently, he is very much into partisanship. Is that correct, Taft? We'll also look at the economic boom, as the economy during this era would boom in a similar fashion to Taft, who has boomed into the frame of the camera. Up, oh, he's moving back to the book. And as you can see, we're going by the book now as we look at science and technology in the new era, as both science and technology would transform the American way of life in ways very predictable and also unpredictable. We'll also look at a changing society. Hmm, I wonder how society changed. Did it change its pants? Considering the transfer from Jinko jeans to skinny jeans, I would say it did. We'll look at a contested culture. I wonder how the culture would be contested. Did they win this contest? If so, what was the score? We'll look at the perils of globalization, as the globe would be finding itself in greater amounts of peril. And did it want to face the peril, or just a little bit of peril? Sounds awfully perilous, if you ask me. And lastly, we'll look at turbulent politics. How would politicians handle this turbulence? Would they handle it smoothly and with grace, or would it make them bump around and get sick and throw up? <laughs> All this and more, this week on The A Push Show. This chapter where we left off with the last chapter with Bill Clinton winning the presidency despite only having about 45% of the vote. Without this majority, though, he would still go after one of the most ambitious political agendas that any president had embarked on in the later half of the 20th century. However, he would find that Congress would grow increasingly partisan and opposed to what he was trying to do. And remember, partisanship is basically when one side is so biased against the other, they can't really get together and compromise on anything. And of course, we will see how Bill Clinton's own personal problems, which were mostly problems he created himself, would also get in the way of what he was trying to do. Bill Clinton was a very naughty president, but not in the way William Howard Taft is naughty. Oh, Taft, you are very naughty, but not how Bill Clinton was naughty. You can't be naughty like that, at least not anymore. You've been neutered. Despite a rocky start and numerous setbacks in terms of appointing the people he wanted, Clinton would be able to celebrate a few key political achievements. He was able to pass a tax increase on the wealthiest Americans, and he was able to win approval of the North American Free Trade Agreement. Clinton was a big advocate of free trade, and this act would remove almost all tariffs and trade barriers between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. However, this would be disastrous for many Americans as this would enable business to shift operations, especially manufacturing, to Mexico where labor was much less organized and industry much less regulated. NAFTA would earn Clinton severe criticism as a neoliberal, which is essentially a person who claims to be a liberal, but whose pro-business and mostly imperialist trade policies are actually much more conservative and exploitative. We would see Clinton engage in policies that would garner similar criticisms throughout his presidency. However, despite his neoliberal triumph in NAFTA, Clinton would fail to institute his incredibly ambitious health care reform. He would appoint his wife, Hillary Clinton, to a task force that would try and institute health care reform that would ensure every American while also driving down health care costs. The plan faced massive opposition from Republicans and also health care lobbyists who worried about diminished profits. It ultimately failed. Oops. <laughs> 
But in 1994, Republicans would do something they hadn't done in over 40 years, and that is win a majority in both the Senate and the House of Representatives. Years of strategizing and building a base of conservatives would pay off, and the Republicans would attempt to construct a somewhat radical legislative agenda. They would attempt to transfer a great deal of power from the federal government back to the states with a focus on restructuring the health care system of Medicaid. In response to this, President Clinton's policy would become increasingly conciliatory and centrist as he would try to work with a more conservative legislative branch. However, he would gain a boost after the government shut down in November of 1995. Because neither the president nor the Congress could reach an agreement on the federal budget, the government literally shut down because of a budget impasse for the first time ever. Interestingly enough, budget impasses have become an unfortunately common occurrence, as after 1995, they have actually happened five times, whereas before 1995, they had never happened at all. The Congress is very stubborn. People are stubborn. Even cats are stubborn, as Taft once protested a new litter box by refusing to poop or pee in it. You were making disgusting trouble, sir. It was disgusting. Regardless, despite our federal government and especially our Congress's bad behavior, at least it's not regressing to 1850s levels of bad behavior where people were nearly being beaten to death in Congress and people are threatening to leave the country altogether. At least, not yet. The government shutdown over the budget impasse would cause a great deal of damage to the Republican Party, as many voters would blame the Republican Congress and were more sympathetic in their view of Clinton as one who at least attempted compromise. Clinton would run against the uninspiring senator from Kansas, Bob Dole, in the 1996 election. Riding a great deal of economic good fortune, as well as his ability to pass a few key pieces of legislation with the Republican Congress, Clinton was able to build a commanding lead in the polls in the run-up to Election Day. Many on the left, however, were still heavily critical of Clinton's concessions to the right as his compromises led to a welfare reform that would prevent a great deal of federal money from going to the poor. However, he did at least increase the national minimum wage, even if it was only by a small margin. As a result, Clinton would win over Dole by 379 electoral votes to Dole's 159. However, Clinton would be unable to rely on any gains made by Democrats in the House or Senate as the Republican Party was able to maintain their majorities in both. And apart from his battles with the Congress, Clinton would find his professional life immensely more complicated because of the decisions he made in his personal life. His very personal life. Interestingly enough, Clinton was the first Democrat to win two presidential terms since FDR, and though he faced an incredibly hostile Republican Congress, he was able to achieve massive popularity. What helped is that he worked with Congress in passing his rather limited domestic reform, which called for tax cuts and tax credits aimed at helping out middle-class Americans. In many ways, he gave Republicans what they wanted, as he would cut taxes but also reduce regulations on business. But Clinton would need all the popularity he could muster when he faced the biggest political crisis of his presidency, which was entirely his own doing. Bill Clinton had allegedly engaged in numerous sexual affairs while he was governor of Arkansas, but would be accused of having another sexual affair with White House intern Monica Lewinsky. Now, being a bad husband is not an impeachable offense, because if it was, I'd venture to guess that about 80 to 90 percent of U.S. presidents should have been impeached. However, lying about an affair in a deposition is impeachable and the Republicans would pounce on that opportunity when Clinton lied about his affair in a deposition. After exhaustive months of relentless press coverage and non-stop late-night television jokes, Clinton would become the second president impeached after Andrew Johnson. However, Clinton would ultimately be acquitted and would again benefit from eight years of relative peace and prosperity. Though his behavior was certainly immoral, many Americans were happy that the relative economic smoothness and also relatively few instances of violent demonstrations or foreign conflicts. 
The only somewhat major conflict would occur in the Balkans region, which was beset with nearly continuous conflict since the dissolution of the country of Yugoslavia. When a long simmering conflict between separatists in the Kosovo region and the surrounding Serbian government bubbled over into a full-blown civil war in 1998, the North American Treaty Organization, or NATO, led by the United States, would engage in a bombing campaign to try and put an end to the conflict. The fight violence with bombs strategy worked, oddly enough, as the Serbian leader Slobodan Milosevic would agree to withdraw troops a week after the bombing. Clinton had solved his one and only foreign entanglement, and despite a presidency marred by scandal, Clinton left office with one of the highest approval ratings of any post-war president. Which, of course, leads us to the incredibly controversial 2000 election. The election pitted former Vice President Al Gore against George W. Bush, who was then governor of Texas and, of course, the son of former President George H. Bush. Both candidates won their party's nomination easily, and both would run very safe and boring centrist campaigns. The race was incredibly tight leading up to Election Day, and that tightness was also seen in congressional races as Republicans retained the House of Representatives, though by only five seats, while the Senate was split evenly at 50 Republicans and 50 Democrats. However, the presidential race was still undecided, as neither candidate was able to win more than the 270 votes needed to win the majority. And this is despite Al Gore winning the popular vote by 500 140,000 people. The race would come down to the state of Florida, as the first count showed an extremely narrow victory for George Bush by about 300 votes. Naturally, this was incredibly too close to call, so the Gore campaign would demand a recount. Well, the recount sort of happened, as it was cut short when a court-ordered deadline approached. When the deadline approached, Bush was ahead by 500 votes. Conveniently, Catherine Harris, the Florida Secretary of State and appointee of George Bush's brother and Florida Governor Jeb Bush would declare the winner. The Supreme Court would vote in favor of Bush, declaring him president by a 5-4 to four decision. Yes. 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 Yes, Taft, it would seem that way, but I'm sure President Bush's brother did a very thorough examination and everything was above board and it wasn't corrupt at all and there was no foul play and everything was fine, everything was normal, everything was okay, and that everybody in the United States of America accepted it and nobody questioned it and nobody, especially me, when it happened when I was in college, ever said, well, he's not my president because he didn't win fairly. Mm, that would be a pretty wise bet, Beast. As president, George Bush faced the constant scrutiny of being a president who was ill-prepared and perhaps intellectually unsuitable for office. However, he would campaign as a moderate Republican who was capable of building coalitions with Democrats in order to pass his agenda. He would successfully win the passage of the largest tax cut in American history with a $1.35 trillion tax cut. However, George W. Bush would become increasingly conservative in policies and downright intolerant in others. Despite increased concerns over gun violence, especially given the ever-increasing frequency of mass shootings in the United States, Bush refused to renew a ban on assault weapons, winning him key points with gun lobbyists and gun enthusiasts. He would also win points with conservative evangelical Christians with a proposed amendment to ban gay marriage in America. However, it was the terrorist attack of September 11th and George W. Bush's response to said attacks that would be the main focus of his presidency. It was also 9-11 as well as continued Republican support that was perhaps largely responsible for George Bush's victory in the 2004 election as American voters are typically more supportive of a wartime president, especially when that war is seen as justified in the eyes of the American public. Bush, riding a wave of support for his war on terror as well as his incredible strong support from conservatives was able to narrowly defeat the mostly uninspiring Democratic candidate in John Kerry with 51% of the popular vote to Kerry's 48%. In this next section, we'll look at the remarkable economic boom of the 1990s and early 2000s as the United States would undergo significant changes to their own economy. However, like earlier periods, the United States would also experience massive issues in terms of the equitable distribution of this wealth created by the economic boom.
The economy of the 1990s and 2000s was very much a product of the economy of the 1970s and 1980s. Both the 70s and 80s saw American businesses constantly worry about energy costs, outdated production methods, and falling victim to outdated technology. However, in the 1990s and 2000s, many American businesses were able to employ new methods of production, which emphasized efficient use of technology and energy, as well as increased corporate mergers to allow companies to maintain a diverse source of revenue and growth. But American workers saw little to no significant financial benefit as costs of labor would also be minimized. Innovation in production and transportation technology allowed many businesses to replace human workers with machines, thus decreasing costs as machines require no salary and will not unionize to ask for increased wages, benefits, or better working conditions. Also, thanks to NAFTA and other policies like it passed during the Clinton administration, many jobs would be outsourced to foreign countries where labor costs were low, oftentimes to the point of near slavery levels of exploitation. Jobs that weren't outsourced were relocated to states in the South and Midwest where union activity was weak, thus enabling companies to pay workers less for their labor. As a result, the overall incomes of middle and lower class Americans would either flatline or decrease while the upper 20% would experience massive gains and the upper 1% would experience nearly exponential levels of growth in terms of wealth. The business-friendly approaches of the Clinton and Bush administrations would only encourage these policies, leaving more and more Americans struggling to make ends meet. Though some industries heavily rewarded educated individuals, especially those who specialized in science and engineering, many Americans saw little to no gain in the economic boom of the 1990s and 2000s. For the first time since World War II, the American poverty rate began to increase as it would creep up from 12% in the 1970s back up to 15% in 2013, as nearly 46 million Americans were living in poverty. However, it wasn't only American labor that faced competition from cheaper, though much more exploited, foreign labor. Americans also faced mounting pressure and competition from abroad, as the more globalized economy made it much more difficult for American businesses to compete with foreign-produced goods. For most of the 20th century, American industry enjoyed relatively insulated economic conditions, but as tariffs were increasingly eliminated and global shipping became increasingly fast and efficient, foreign-made goods became more easy easily available in the country. In 1970, American companies exported nearly $43 billion worth of goods throughout the world, while American companies imported about $40 billion worth of goods to consume inside the country. By 2006, the total value of American exports increased to $1 trillion, while the total value of imports also increased to $1.8 trillion, meaning the United States was spending $1.8 trillion on foreign goods while only receiving $1 trillion on goods that it sold throughout the world. Since 1971, the United States has endured a world trade imbalance nearly every year. But massive income and wealth inequality rooted in centuries-old systems of racism and classism exacerbated by a neoliberal agenda of global labor exploitation aside, one cannot talk about the economy of the 1990s and early 2000s without talking about the role of technology and how that played within these economic systems. Right, Taft? We'll see as new breakthroughs in digital technology as well as internet technology would transform American life in ways perhaps not seen since the Industrial Revolution. The most foundational element of the technological revolution of the last 40 years was the development of the microprocessor, which enabled the development of personal computers. With the microprocessor, gone were the days of computers taking up entire rooms, as the International Business Machines Company would employ the microprocessor to develop the personal computer, or PC, primarily for business use beginning in the early 1970s. By 1977, Apple would launch its own Apple II personal computer, which was the first machine widely available for the public. Years later, IBM would release its own line of personal computers, and computing machines have never really looked back as computers have become increasingly powerful, increasingly convenient, and increasingly necessary for numerous aspects of modern life. Along with the widespread availability of microprocessor-powered computers came the huge and downright dangerous and terrifyingly rapid development of the Internet. You're right, Taft. 
No man could ever hope to wield and control the power of the internet by himself. True. Cats kind of rule the internet. Facts. The internet actually has its earliest roots in the 1960s as the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, would funnel federal funds into scientific research for mostly defense. One of these projects would result in 23 defense computers being linked via the ARPA network, which mostly served research labs in American universities. With the development of the personal computer and also digital mail or email, the number of connected computers would gradually increase and ARPA would become known as the Internet. By 1984, there were fewer than a thousand computers connected to the Internet. A decade later, that number would rocket up to over six million. By 2013, the number is up to two billion. In 2022, it is estimated that there are nearly 46 billion devices connected to the Internet, nearly seven per person on the planet, and that number is expected to go up significantly. To help organize the internet to a degree, Tim Berners-Lee, a British scientist, would introduce the World Wide Web, which was a system to organize the nearly endless reaches of the internet and every piece of information or data contained within it. However, not all of the internet is on the World Wide Web, but when people go to a website on a search engine, whether it be Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Safari, or Netscape, that site is on the World Wide Web. Taft, you a big Netscape guy? Nice. Along with breakthroughs in computing, there would also be breakthroughs in genetics, as geneticists would build off of centuries of research regarding human genetics. Dating back to Gregor Mendel in the 19th century and continuing on with discoveries made by Watson and Crick, scientists researching human genetics were able to unlock many secrets behind human development and also human disorders located within our DNA. Thanks to nearly $3 billion of federal funding to the National Center of the Human Genome, the Human Genome Project attempted to identify nearly every gene that causes every aspect of our biological development. With DNA research, scientists have been able to use DNA as a means of identification of individuals in crime investigations, have used it to identify traits that may lead to certain diseases or disorders down the line, and have, of course, used DNA and the process of altering DNA to try and improve human life. However, debates have occurred regarding the ethical use of DNA as some have worried that altering people's genes is a slippery slope from more malevolent forces akin to eugenics. And next we'll look at the changing society of the United States in the 1990s and early 2000s as the nation would become increasingly diverse as new waves of migration would come into the country, but the nation would become increasingly old as birth rates would drop, but the baby boomer generation would continue to live longer and longer. However, much like every other era of prosperity within American history, we would see this era also experience the same patterns of racially inequitable distribution of wealth and income throughout the country. Thanks to the advent of birth control, along with the stagnant and oftentimes declining rates of wealth in the middle and lower classes, birth rates would decline in the latter half of the 20th century. Along with that, the huge bump in population from the baby boom generation of the 1940s to the 1960s would grow older, thus causing significant impacts on society. As the rate of workers between the prime working ages of 24 to 54 declined, the need for labor from abroad would increase. As a result of the the 1965 Immigration Reform Act, which removed national origins as a criterion for admissions, more and more immigrants would arrive in the United States from parts previously unknown to most Americans. However, despite the massive increase in non-white Americans compared to white Americans, the average age of Americans would also increase as the boomer generation continued to age. In 1996, the average age of the United States was 34. As I'm saying this in 2022, the current average is 38.1 and climbing. And as we continue our analysis of American society, we turn to racial demographics. And as we examine the experience of African Americans living in the post-civil rights era of the 1960s, we see two very different experiences as some would find themselves enjoying the opportunities and points of access never before gained within the African American community. However, a disproportionate amount of African Americans never experienced the benefits or opportunities in social advancement afforded by the liberal policies of the 1960s. 
1960s. By the first decade of the 20th century, nearly a half of the African American population lived within the middle class as more and more African Americans attained good paying middle class jobs. They also were able to move into more affluent and more urban and suburban neighborhoods and had the same percentage of high school graduates going on to college as white students. There is no arguing that many African Americans saw a tremendous degree of improvement in their overall quality of life compared to their parents who lived through the high point of the civil rights movement. But this was not true for all African Americans, as nearly a third of all African Americans were never given the opportunity to take advantage of liberal programs and economic prosperity. This impoverished group would be referred to by some sociologists as the quote-unquote underclass, as they would live in decaying urban neighborhoods badly needing investment with extremely limited opportunities for the members of the underclass to escape their situation. The pressures of poverty would have many other added effects as impoverished families would be often disrupted, which would also be a factor in the dramatic rise of single-parent families within the African-American community. What would also cause increase to this rise would be the massive amounts of drug abuse within the African-American community and also racist systems of policing and incarceration, which would further entrench African-Americans into rates of poverty as both incarcerated and formerly incarcerated African-Americans would be unable to provide for their families. African Americans would be severely and disproportionately incarcerated because of zero tolerance drug enforcement laws implemented during the so called quote unquote American War on Drugs during the Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administrations. Considering the rates of addiction and the proliferation of drug use and availability still present in the United States today, the war on drugs is a war we are losing badly. When one considers the millions of lives affected by the policing of drug crimes that didn't work to stop drug use and abuse, especially within the black community, the war on drugs becomes a racist tragedy that acclaimed author, lawyer, and civil rights activist Michelle Alexander has called the, quote, new Jim Crow. But the war on drugs wasn't without reason, as the United States had a significant drug problem in the 80s and 90s, and if we're being honest, still has a massive drug problem today. American politicians worried heavily about the prevalence of crack cocaine within urban communities, and with fairly good reason, as the drug was incredibly widespread at the time, is incredibly addictive, and is incredibly dangerous. However, other highly addictive and lethal drugs were also in widespread use, including, but not limited to, powder cocaine cocaine, opioids, heroin, which is a type of opioid, methamphetamine, not to mention the millions of Americans who suffered from alcoholism. In addition to the dangers of drug abuse would come a somewhat connected issue of the AIDS virus. AIDS would first appear in the early 80s and with a high degree of uncertainty and fear. The disease would hit members of the gay community and intravenous drug users particularly hard as it became apparent that the virus spread rapidly as a result from the spread of blood as well as from unprotected sex. However, by the mid-90s, researchers began developing effective treatment for the AIDS virus. The treatments to prevent AIDS and the treatment for those already infected with AIDS or HIV have steadily improved in terms of their effectiveness and their availability as the amount of people who have died from AIDS-related complications has declined from nearly 1.7 million in 2005 to less than 700,000 in 2018. And as American society grew more diverse and the demands for a more equitable society grew louder, we would see a contested culture emerge as many of the same demands for that equitable society rooted in the movements of feminism, civil rights, and environmentalism would continue on in the new era. Battles over feminism would continue to be fought as the New Right would successfully fight against the push for an equal rights amendment in the 1980s. Additionally, conservatives would take aim at abortion laws. For many Americans, the debate over abortion seemed to be settled with the Roe v. Wade decision of the 1970s. As a result, abortions were the most commonly performed medical surgery in the United States in the 1980s. However, growing opposition to abortions would mount within conservative communities as well as Catholic 
Catholic communities as they would increasingly identify themselves as the, quote, right to life movement, unquote. Right to lifers were sometimes incredibly aggressive, even to the point of engaging in terrorist activities like bombings of abortion clinics and the murder of doctors who performed abortions. But they would be successful in persuading many state legislatures to halt taxpayer funding for abortion procedures, thus eliminating many poor women's ability to have an abortion. But supporters of a woman's right to choose would push back with their own quote-unquote pro-choice movement. In many areas of the country, pro-choice activists were as strong, if not stronger, than the right to lifers. Pro-choice advocates found safety in the presidencies of Clinton and Obama, who both supported a woman's right to choose. However, both Bush presidencies would actively oppose abortion and would make many women's lives more difficult as they made abortion increasingly difficult. In terms of the environment, the environmental movement would continue to grow worldwide after the Earth Day movement of the 1970s. The demands and warnings for effective change regarding carbon emissions and addressing climate change would continue to grow louder and louder as numerous countries would meet in 1997 in Kyoto, Japan, to agree to reduce their carbon emissions in order to begin the process of addressing climate change. However, neither the United States nor China would agree to said protocols, which is incredibly unfortunate as those two countries produce more pollutants than all other countries. Despite growing concerns from climate scientists and the general public, the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations would all fail to enact meaningful policies to address climate change as all presidents would fail to stand up to business interests that worried about the inevitable regulations and costs that would come with said legislation. Next, we'll look at the perils of globalization, because today it is easier than it's ever been to communicate and travel throughout the world. I mean, you can talk to somebody on the other side of the planet within seconds, and you can travel there within hours if you have the means to, and as long as there are no travel restrictions. Right, Taft? And though for a lot of people it's really exciting to have such a global society in which we can consume so many things from around the world, a lot of people still have great fears of the perils of globalization and what that could bring. And indeed, in the early 2000s, we would see a lot of those fears be brought to life. In the 90s and early 2000s, Americans became increasingly skeptical about the increased interventionist role of the United States in the increasingly globalized world. George H. Bush would even refer to the quote-unquote New World Order, which referred to the idea that the geopolitical situation had shifted from the bipolar Cold War to one of unquestioned American dominance. However, many on the right and the left began to worry about this increased role of the United States as global policeman, peacekeeper, and arbiter. Critics on the right would worry that the United States was falling increasingly under foreign influence as the United States entangled itself in peacekeeping operations in the Balkans and Africa. Critics on the left would worry that the United States was using its military to become increasingly imperialist and exploitative. Organized labor would charge that relaxed trade restrictions was simply a means of weakening the labor movement by moving operations to foreign lands where labor regulations were non-existent. They weren't wrong. And environmentalists and humanitarians would accuse the United States of opening trade relations with countries where regulations on industrial pollution and workers' rights were essentially non-existent. They weren't wrong either. These worries would often manifest themselves in various protests like the massive protest against the large meeting of countries belonging to the World Trade Organization in Seattle of November of 1999. These protests, and many like them, would continue to occur in the United States and elsewhere in the world as more and more people worried about the prospect of governments along with massive international corporations working together to ensure benefits for a very wealthy and exclusive elite at the expense of the majority of humanity. However, the United States and other Western nations were not alone in their fears and apprehensions regarding globalism, as many countries directly impacted by globalism also expressed dissatisfaction. Sometimes extreme dissatisfaction, as we see the Middle East region in particular, would take umbrage not only in the political and economic sense, but in the religious sense as well. The Middle East had felt long since aggrieved as Western policies regarding the acquisition of oil and the establishment of the State of Israel 
had left many Middle Eastern countries feeling powerless and exploited by the far superior Western nations led predominantly by the United States. Perhaps one of the most clear examples of this dissatisfaction would manifest itself in the nation of Iran when a largely student-led revolution against an authoritarian regime friendly to the West occurred. As many Middle Easterners felt increasingly marginalized and exploited by the West, a desire to embrace culture distinctly Middle Eastern and non-Western would increase as millions within the region would adopt more fundamentalist versions of Islam in opposition to more secular and Christian cultures of the West. To many in the Middle East, embracing anything except a strict and oftentimes hostile doctrine of Islam was seen as catering to the West and the United States, who were engaged in numerous policies of political political, economic, and perhaps cultural exploitation. These movements would become increasingly militant as many Islamic fundamentalists began to believe that the only way to exact any degree of influence on a global scale would be to inflict horrific violence upon key aspects of Western life in order to spread chaos and fear within the Western government and Western society. Bombings, kidnappings, shootings, and other assorted acts of violence sought to terrorize and destabilize Western society as the increased fear of terrorist attacks would spread along with massive and perhaps disproportionate and sometimes misguided responses to said fears of terrorism. Which brings us to a discussion of what terrorism truly is, as it is one of those words that we're taught to despise, and some even have gone so far as to offer their lives to fight against it. The term terrorism was first used to describe the radical and brutal policies of French revolutionaries in the 1790s, who often used violence and repression to overthrow the perhaps equally oppressive and brutal French monarchy at the time. Since then, the word has been used intermittently, but our current definition is a product of the 21st century. Terrorism, as mentioned earlier, refers to violent acts committed by people who seek to use violence to instill chaos and fear in order to destabilize or placate their enemy. Terrorist acts have occurred in numerous places at numerous points in history, whether it's the Irish committing acts of terror against the British, North Americans committing acts of terrorism against the British, American Southern whites using violence to terrorize African Americans seeking empowerment, or the aforementioned French revolutionaries reacting against their own monarchy, terror and fear have been tools used to hurt one's much stronger enemy. However, terrorism typically came to be understood as acts of violence taken by foreign political groups who sought to destabilize American globalism through violence. Though these acts were rare, they were well known by Americans before September 11, 2001, as terrorist attacks would occur in the bombing of Marine Barracks in Beirut in 1983, the bombing of American embassies in 1998, the bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993, the assault of the USS Cole in 1998, and the bombing of a federal building in Oklahoma City in 1995. Of course, the most famous act of terrorism would occur on September 11, 2001, with the destruction of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. On a Tuesday morning, two hijacked planes were flown into the towers, causing both to collapse. Two other planes were also hijacked. One would hit the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and the other crashed into a Pennsylvania field after the passengers overtook the hijackers. Nearly 3,000 people died as a result of the attacks, which shocked Americans to their core, as people soon considered terrorism to be the number one concern facing the nation. In the months and years that followed the attack, Attack, restrictions on immigration and international travel and banking would be implemented, many of which would remain in place for decades. After the attack on 9-11, George W. Bush would institute a war on terrorism. Though relatively few Americans understood what terrorism truly was, most assumed that it meant going after radical Islamic groups located in the Middle East who wished to do harm to the United States. American intelligence had discovered that the attacks on the World Trade Center had been developed and executed by a radical Islamic terrorist network known as Al-Qaeda, which was headed by a then relatively 
incredibly obscure leader named Osama bin Laden. Before 9-11, bin Laden was mostly unknown outside of the Middle East, but after the attacks, he became one of the most reviled figures in the United States and the West. The United States would wage war on the Taliban regime that headed the country of Afghanistan as they were believed to be sheltering bin Laden. After an overwhelming attack by American troops, the Taliban regime quickly collapsed, causing their leaders to quickly flee to remote areas in the mountains of Afghanistan and neighboring Pakistan. Bin Laden was not yet apprehended in these raids. In addition to the war in Afghanistan, President Bush would take aim at other countries he deemed were hostile to the United States. In a State of the Union address in January of 2002, Bush spoke of an axis of evil consisting of Iran, North Korea, and Iraq as he would contend that these countries were either harboring terrorists or developing weapons of mass destruction. Oh, you are not. After this speech, the Bush administration would build the case that Iraq in particular was developing weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear weapons and biological and chemical weapons, harboring terrorists, especially Al-Qaeda, and violating human rights provisions against their own citizens. It would later turn out that only the crimes against humanity part was true, as no evidence of weapons of mass destruction or sympathies to terrorist organizations were ever found to be in Iraq. But the United States would go to war anyway. American troops would begin an attack in 2003, which would capture Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein that same year and execute him three years later. And George Bush himself would land a plane on an aircraft carrier in California declaring mission accomplished in May of 2003. However, this turned out to be either a gross miscalculation or a flat-out lie, as fighting in Iraq continued for six more years, costing the lives of 4,200 American soldiers and well over 100,000 Iraqis. American support for the war plummeted early on as it became increasingly apparent that weapons of mass destruction did not exist and that many members of the Bush administration had financial incentives to wage war in Iraq. The Bush administration's support for the war marked a sharp departure from earlier American intervention efforts abroad. Whereas earlier administrations sought to negotiate or work through international organizations like the UN or NATO, the Bush doctrine would use direct and severe military intervention, citing a need for America to provide greater stability. Ironically enough, this same doctrine would cause a greater degree of instability. And in this final section, we'll look at the turbulent political atmosphere of the end of the Bush administration and the beginning of the Obama administration as natural disasters, a recession that nearly became a full-on depression, as well as an increasingly oppositional political atmosphere in the Congress made for passing any sort of meaningful legislation nearly impossible that would benefit the majority of Americans. Got him. For the first three years of his presidency, George Bush received a great deal of support in the wake of 9-11 and his hard stance against those countries that he determined were responsible for the attack. He would also pass sweeping tax cuts in 2001 that benefited the wealthiest Americans and almost no one else. The belief was that if the wealthiest Americans received tax cuts, they would be more likely to reinvest their money into companies they owned and thus create more jobs. However, that didn't really happen as the wealth gap between the rich and poor in America widened to almost chasm-like proportions. He would also pass the No Child Left Behind Act that sought to use increased standardized testing in order to determine successful and failing schools in order to receive more or less government funding. Though the act was successful in increasing the use of testing data to determine student growth, it massively punished schools that were underfunded already and fostered an atmosphere of teaching to tests rather than fostering a desire to learn for learning's sake within students. However, as the war in Iraq and Afghanistan continued, as weapons of mass destruction seemed to be more and more non-existent, as lives continued to be lost over these lies and failures, American support for the Bush administration continued to drop. Bush would narrowly defeat Democratic challenger John Kerry, whose own lack of charisma failed to defeat a president who was hemorrhaging support. 
Bush's support would be further damaged by his own federal administration's massive bungling of the crisis in New Orleans and surrounding Gulf Coast areas in the wake of the catastrophic hurricane, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. As a slow and disorganized response failed to provide for folks hit hardest by this disaster, support for the Bush administration continued to drop. By the time George Bush left the presidency in 2008, he had achieved the dubious distinction of having the lowest approval rating ever recorded for a sitting president up to that time. An unpopular war, a horribly handled national disaster, and policies that seemed to enrich the few at the expense of the many would make George Bush one of the most unpopular presidents in American history. However, a massive financial crisis would not only doom Bush's legacy, but would also set back the Republican Party for over a decade. In the run-up to the election of 2008, the Republican candidate John McCain, a senator and decorated Vietnam War veteran, faced the young and inspiring Senator Barack Obama. Obama was handsome, charming, inspiring, and poised to become the first African-American president after narrowly defeating former First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton in the Democratic primary. Many Americans, especially young Americans, leaped at the prospect of electing the first African-American president who preached a message of hope and change. But perhaps what benefited Obama the most was the 2008 financial crisis that many saw as the fault of George W. Bush and the Republicans. Ironically enough, it could actually be also blamed on the neoliberal policies of the Clinton administration, which deregulated business, including repealing the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933. This New Deal legislation provided additional regulation and oversight over business, but with that act repealed, businesses were free to do whatever they wanted, even if it meant nearly destroying the American economy. What essentially would cause the crisis is that banks and real estate firms tried to sell as many houses as they possibly could and came up with loads of tricks to get people loans to buy houses they couldn't really afford. In the early to mid-2000s, all sorts of people were buying houses they could not really afford as they were enticed by real estate agents and lenders who benefited from these sales. In addition, numerous massive financial institutions would also support and initially benefit from these loans. A housing bubble occurred, and as it became apparent in 2007, as more and more people had to default on their mortgages because they couldn't really afford them, people who had built entire fortunes on these flimsy loans would see their money disappear. People would have to leave their homes, banks lost fortunes, people lost their jobs, and it would appear that the economy may collapse into a depression similar to the depression of the 1930s. The housing crisis would doom the candidacy of John McCain and would propel Obama to victory. To deal with this crisis, Obama would institute a $750 billion relief fund known as the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, to bail out struggling financial institutions, the very same financial institutions that preceded the financial crisis in the first place. The banks were determined to be too big to fail, as millions of Americans had invested their wealth into these institutions. Though thousands of working class and middle class Americans would lose their homes and their wealth, the banks Banks would stay afloat, their CEOs would often stay in their positions or be fired or forced to resign with millions of dollars in stock options and severance, and no one responsible went to jail or faced any sort of meaningful consequence for essentially gambling with the already meager wealth of the American people to increase their own already massive amounts of wealth. Since many of the banking CEOs technically did not break any laws because most laws to stop them had been repealed by George W. Bush or Bill Clinton, Obama could could do very little to leverage consequences. However, many have criticized that Obama could have done something but chose not to as he owed his political cess to many of those very same people. But to be fair, President Obama faced one of the most difficult set of challenges a president could ever face as he entered office in January of 2009 with a massive financial crisis, two wars on the other side of the planet, and an extraordinarily hostile Congress that often went out of their way to such a degree that some wondered if they were deliberately sabotaging the nation just to make Obama's presidency as difficult as possible. Obama's first challenge was addressing the rapidly declining economy. 
To address this, Obama would pass a stimulus package that would include tax cuts, expanded unemployment benefits, and increased spending on education, infrastructure, police, health care, and job creation. In the midst of this massive financial crisis, Obama would also pass the Affordable Care Act, which sought to provide universal health care, a long-standing liberal initiative. However, this program would be heavily criticized, as some would contend it did not do enough to ensure accessible quality health care for all Americans, and conservatives complain that it was socialized medicine that would be of a lesser quality and also too costly for taxpayers to maintain. Derisively referred to as Obamacare, the plan got off to a terrible start as it was beset with technical problems. To this day, there are still millions of Americans who struggle to access quality health care or are saddled with ruinous health care related debts. And one of the most vocal opponents of Obamacare was a group known as the Tea Party. Named for the 18th century group of Bostonians who resisted British taxation and the regulation of commerce, the Tea Party advocated for a smaller role of government in the form of reduced taxes and reduced regulation. The Tea Party would find a great deal of support from wealthy conservatives who really liked the idea of paying less in taxes and having fewer regulations to worry about. As a result, this relatively small group received a disproportionate amount of support and influence as large amounts of money would be dumped into the campaigns of Tea Party-supported political candidates who were almost always Republican and would receive favorable if not completely fabricated representation in conservative media. 130 Tea Party-supported candidates would be sworn in Congress by 2013, causing an already polarized Congress to become more entrenched in their resistance to compromise. As a result of this political gridlock, a full-blown government shutdown occurred, causing many federal services to be shut down from October 1st through the 16th in 2013 because Congress could not reach an agreement on the federal budget. In terms of his international agenda, Obama had lofty ambitions as he would try to resolve the tensions between Israelis and Palestinians with very limited success. He would also initially increase the amount of troops on the ground in Afghanistan and would struggle to build a better trade relationship with China and South Korea, two of Asia's largest trading blocks. However, he would win the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to build cooperation between people anyway. Obama would also face significant criticism from the left, as many accused him of neoliberalism and catering to the right. His failure to punish financiers who were responsible for the 2008 financial crisis, among other allowances to wealthy capitalists, would inspire the Occupy Wall Street movement, which was a populist movement located in New York City. The movement called out the wealthiest 1% and accused this wealthy minority of controlling nearly half of the nation's wealth while actively trying to increase their degree of wealth and exploitation. In this movement, we see American concerns about growing economic inequality continue to manifest themselves in the form of popular protest movements. Despite all of these criticisms, Obama still was able to win over many voters with his speaking ability, his charm, and his intelligence. He also had help from the fact that the economy was improving, that the war in Iraq appeared to be de-escalating, and that the mastermind behind 9-11, Osama bin Laden, had been apprehended and killed by American forces. That, and the fact that he ran against the relatively uninspiring conservative candidate from Utah, Mitt Romney, allowed Obama to win a relatively comfortable second term with 51% of the popular vote and 332 electoral votes to Romney's 47% of the popular vote and 206 electoral votes. Obama's second term would be fraught with numerous challenges, many of which he failed to overcome. One of the major challenges he faced would be a leak of intelligence from the National Security Agency when a contractor named Edward Snowden leaked several documents indicating that the United States had been spying on various foreign heads of state and persons of interest despite having no legal basis to do so. Some have called the leak the most significant revelation of secret government activity since the Pentagon Papers of 1971. Obama would also continue to face the extraordinary political gridlock as he would fail to pass meaningful gun reform legislation despite the continued and increased frequency of horrific gun violence in the form of mass shootings and suicides. 
Opposition from Republicans and gun lobbyists who supported them prohibited Obama from making any significant gains in gun reform. However, he would achieve some success as he would be able to pass the Border Security, Economic Opportunity, and Immigration Modernization Act of 2013 as a meaningful path to citizenship for undocumented residents who were living and working within the United States. Heading into the final years of his presidency, Obama would struggle to meet many of his initiatives as many working-class Americans grew increasingly frustrated with the failed promises of change. The inefficacy of the liberal agenda of the Obama administration, the increased polarization of wealth at the expense of the majority of Americans, and the prospect of stalled American progress caused many Americans to become disillusioned with many of the traditional political figures of both the Democratic or Republican Party. The possibility of people turning to a less traditional political candidate seemed greater than ever. And sadly, the book that is the basis for this lecture was published in 2015, which means any history that has occurred since 2015 is not really covered in this book and also this lecture series. And if you've been paying any attention all, there's been just a bit of history that has happened since then. Will we cover that in a future lecture series, in a Chapter 33 or a Beyond Brinkley lecture series? I don't know, difficult to say. But Taft and I will continue to read, we will continue to listen, and we will continue to learn because one of the beautiful and frustrating things about history is they keep making more of it. And hopefully you found some use in these lectures. Hopefully you've learned a thing or two, and hopefully it's made you smile once or twice. I know, trust me, history can be a massive bummer sometimes, and it can be very overwhelming sometimes too. But with some snacks in your belly and a good friend by your side, it can be okay sometimes too. Hopefully you guys have found this enjoyable. Hopefully you found it useful. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. And always, always never forget, we got to keep pushing, G. Mm -hmm.
Taft, how are you going to turn your back on the people in the last lecture? That's rude, sir. Or are you trying to tell them with your back that we will be back?